Um, my name is Jeff Arrow, and I have been with uh, TST for 27 years. I'll give you a little history on myself. And um, I'm the VP of purchasing there. Um, I started the scrap business in a family scrap operation. My family had scrap yards in California. So I've been at the end where I'm sorting it, I'm cleaning it, um, hauling it, everything else, and then uh, moved up into uh, working with a secondary smelter, which has been quite uh, exciting. So let me, uh, I'll start the presentation, and if you have questions, ask as we're going. You don't need to wait to the very end. So let's begin. Okay, we currently have, TST currently has actually three locations. We have one in California, we have one in Texas, and we just opened up another one in uh, Mexico. That was about a year ago, and that's our fully operational now. And we link in with uh, Nissan, and we do what's called hot metal transfers there. That means we, we melt the metal, we put it in a big crucible, and we send it right to the die caster. So we're going to talk about aluminum today. And I want to go back a second and uh, congratulate Jim on doing a very good presentation of the ones who are in here for the copper. I saw it and did a fantastic job. A lot of information there with the copper and the brasses. Uh, aluminum might not be as intricate, but it does have its own uh, issues that you have to pay attention to. So when you talk about aluminum and going back to the copper and brasses, the aluminum is much lighter than the copper is. And it's lightweight metal, and the relevance of being lightweight is that a lot of aluminum is used in cars. And cars, at this point, as we all know, is the trick there is to get the cars lighter so you get better fuel efficiency. So that's why aluminum is being used more and more. And just recently, Ford went into the 150 pickups and is adding more aluminum to lighten that load. And that's 700 pounds more weight on the aluminum side. One of the benefits of using aluminum versus iron, also, if you want to take pictures with your cameras, I have no problem with that. Feel free to do that. Uh, the melting point of aluminum versus iron is much lo lower. Again, that's a, a savings on energy, which is a savings on cost. The weight, as we talked about earlier, you have iron at 7.86 versus aluminum density 2.7. That's a huge difference. Okay. Aluminum is a good conductor of electricity, and over the years we've seen aluminum wire be used in place of copper sometimes for, elect for the electric. They're still doing that. Uh, one of the good things about aluminum also is it does not rust, and that's in reference to steel that would rust. Okay. Aluminum is 100% recyclable. For example, if you have a can, theoretically, you could melt that can 10 times. Not the same can, but if you take a can, you melt it, you get 90% back. You can do that cycle 10 times, so there's a benefit to that recycling aspect there. Some of the things I want to, we're going to go through today is learning the alloys. In aluminum, just as in copper and brass, the important part of the metal is knowing what the alloys are, knowing what the major element is, knowing what the minor elements are. Because when you go to sell, you're basically selling that major element. And we'll get into that a little further in the presentation. From my perspective as a mill buyer, so I'm going to give you information as a mill buyer, not as a scrap buyer. I'm looking at it, what can I tell you about me and my operation to make you better at yourself? So from our perspective, I look at two things. If you come out with anything today, remember these two things, recovery and chemistry. So when I'm going to buy something from you, I'm going to 
first I want to know what it is. So that's the chemistry. The next thing I need to know is what is the recovery? Because from the recovery, I'm going to be able to price it at that point also. So I'm going to know what my yield is, and that's the important part. I need to know if I melt something, if I start with 100 pounds, am I going to end up with 90 pounds of aluminum? Because that's what's going to go into my ingot. That's the actual yield that I put into the ingot. So that's why that recovery is so important. And all the different aluminum grades have different recoveries. Also, how to prepare your scrap for a secondary, for someone like me, or any other secondary, or for that matter, a primary. We all have re re regulations, we all have issues, and we all have loading and unloading capability. So we need it prepared so that we can handle it properly. And one thing I learned early on in my career in the scrap business, when I was very young, was that there really is no bad scrap. You just have to find the market for it. Um, a short story, um, as I grew up in a family business, so I'd be at the plant with my dad, and he'd buy something, I said, what is it? He said, I don't know. I said, well, how do you know I said? Well, I bought it low enough, I'll find a market for it. Well, that worked 40 years ago, 45 years ago. A little trickier today because you can't always find that market. As you, you will find the market, but the price you don't always know because there's a lot of environmental issues today. A lot of companies can't do things they used to do. Even overseas, China is changing on some of the things they do and the way they do it. But there is a market for everything. These are some of the users of, of scrap aluminum. Secondary aluminum smelter is what we do, what TST does. Rolling mills, foundries, die casters, Die casters and founders are people we're going to sell our product to. Okay. Now, a die caster can be somebody um, that is making a part. They take our metal, they melt it down again, and they put it into a die. And at the end of that line, they're going to have a product. It could be a water pump. It could be an engine block. It could be a part for an airplane. Okay. There are converters. There are exporters, there's brokers, and there's dealers. So that's just some of the people that are using the aluminum. This is what we, I was starting with a little bit ago. The important for us, and actually it's something that you need to relate to when you're going to sell your product, is the chemistry and the recovery. Now, I have some handouts Jim, if you'd be so kind to help me with this. I hope there's enough. And we'll get more into those as we go. But basically, that is a list of chemistries. So chemistry recovery, essential. Know, what, know the alloy you're selling. You call me up and you say, hey, I've got some painted old sheet. I give you one price. I've got some MLC. I'm going to give you another price because they're different. So you need to know what you're selling. Now, you can get into different alloys and you say, well, I think it's a 2000 series. And my first question, well, do you think it's a 2024 or 2219? Okay. Now, you can't always get to that. Now, if you have the gun, you'd be able to get there. You'll have that number. But if you don't, if you know the range, I can still give you pricing. Okay. And also, sometimes when you get like a 2219 or a 2024, that's a product you might want to sell to the primary, which has got a better value at that point. Okay. So that's right. Then you want to, you need to know, it's good for you to know, not just me, not just my company, but other companies, what they buy, and how they operate. So you need to know the consumers you sell to. That's very important. That'll help you in your pricing. There are commodities when you sell, we're very much into no iron and non-metallics. So that's something that you'd want to, we'd want to know. Are there any contaminants on it? Okay. So safety, environmental issues, health concerns, those are all things that we take into account also. Things you'll be taking into account when you're selling.
That's our product. We're, we're a consumer, so we're melting the raw material. I'm going to show you some pictures of our facility in Fontana, California. For those who, has anybody here, by show of hands, been to a secondary aluminum smelter? Oh, good. Okay. Good. So, for a lot of you, you haven't. So, these furnaces, our furnaces hold 180,000 pounds at a time. Okay. And what you're seeing there is the, the metal, that's the front of the furnace, and the metal has gone in, and we're raking it to take the metal, get the metal, the metal to melt quicker. That's another view. Now, if you see the yellow spot in the back, that's one of the gas burners. There are two in that chamber. And what happens is we're melting in a side, we're putting metal in a side chamber, and it's hot. The furnaces, you should think of them in a circular pattern. We load on the side. That's the side, OK? So we're loading in a side well. Now, in that sidewell is molten metal. So it starts off there. So we're hoping to use some of the molten metal that's already there to melt the new aluminum. So it goes down and goes into solution. Now, next to that is a rotary pump. Now, that's not what I'll show you yet. OK, on the right side of that is going to be a rotary pump. What that does, it's a pump that's in the well and it's circulating. It's like a big fan, but it's underwater, and it circulates and keeps the metal moving back into the main chamber. The main chamber has the furnace, has the gas burners. That's where we're getting the heat from, and we keep circulating. After the, the metal is melted, and we have the chemistry that we want, and we check the chemistry in that furnace every 12 inches. And we do that because we don't want to get out of spec. We have a requirement from our customer that will say, we want the iron to be at 0.1 or 0.5 or 1.0. We want the chemistry at 2.0. We want the silicon to be at 7.5. Well, if we don't hit that specification, we can't sell our product to them. We're held accountable down to the third decimal point. After that, they've got to, we either have to negotiate it, which doesn't happen because they won't take it. Because when they're making that part of product, they're meeting an engineering spec that was designed for them for that water pump. So it has to have certain properties and certain chemistries to get to that. So we have to check it all the time. And if we're in spec at the very end, then we can pour it. If we're out of spec in the process, during that time, we have the opportunity to add different scrap to get, on, get in spec again. So at this point, it's already in spec, and we're pouring it. And this is the wheel there that goes around, just goes around, and the metal is coming out of it. We make 15 pound ingots, and we make 25 pound ingots. That's a little closer view. And what you can see, the silver there, that's the aluminum ingot at that point. That's a 25 pounder, and I know that because I look at the height in the mold. Okay. That's the end of the line. It's already been poured. It's already been quenched. And this is about 30 yards at the end of that quenching, uh, where the ink came was being poured into the mold. This is about 30 yards past that. It's already hard, so it can be stacked at that point. A lot of our customers want their ingot in one metric ton bundles. And that's what that is. And we stack them sideways and we, we strap them so that they all stay together. And now we will keep a information on what that bundle actually is. We have heat sheets that will identify the whole lot. And we do that because when we have to justify what we made, that's how we justify it to our supplier. We also make a button that will identify the chemistry in there. It's the same chemistry, but it's a small button. This is what we call a button. And it goes into our spectrometer. It's a much bigger machine than the guns that Jim has. But this is a standard. It's going to be an Alcoa standard. 
and we calibrate our spectrometers twice a day, and then we shoot this button to that chemistry, we find out what the exact chemistry is. This button goes with the load to the supplier, or the customer, I'm sorry, to the customer. They test it to make sure it's accurate to what they asked for, and if it is, then they accept it and they start melting that metal. But they won't melt it until they've tested it because they can't take the chance of having bad chemistry on their parts. I'm going to leave these up here at the end. You're welcome to take a look at it. That's a closer look at the ingots. And one thing to notice that's important at, that, at this point because it'll come up later, notice that there are no lines on that. It's a single pore. Okay, so there's, there's nothing extra in there. It's, not, it's poured at one time, so there's no lines where the pore stopped and started, and that's important. Okay. These are what we call sows. Okay. Now remember, the ingot is 15 to 25 pounds. The sow is about 1,100 pounds. We love to make sows because it's easier for us to do it. It's more economical. But the restriction on an ingot or a sow comes down from the die caster, the people we sell it to. A lot of die casters, when you send the ingot to them, they have a small pot at the end of the line. Just remember, what happens with a die caster is they've got a melting point at the end of their line, they melt the metal, and it goes through and it goes and pours into that, let's say a head. So it makes the head. That's the beginning process for their head. A lot of times their melting furnaces are only big enough to handle the ingot. If they've got a big enough furnace, they can take the sap. But not that many people can do that at this point. We're hoping in the future that's going to be the process. Okay. Now that was the ingot side. Now what I'm going to show you next is our tandem side. It, tandem side, ingot side was for automotive. The tandem side is more for aerospace. So on the ingot, it was a horizontal process. On the tandem side, which is going to have the what we call billets and bigger sows, and it's a vertical process. So what happens is the metal, the furnaces are about the same size, 180,000 pounds per, per uh, chamber. But now we're, the, the metal comes out, goes through runners, and goes, these are, at the top is the diameter of the billet we're going to make. We make up to 44 inches diameter, which is a huge billet. So the molten metal comes through the mold, goes into the top, and goes down. And you can see the silver part just below the table. That's the aluminum. That's the billet. So what's happening is there's a platen underneath that, and that's going to keep going down. It keeps going down, 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 until it's reached the length that we're looking for. At that point, the top is picked, is, is goes, goes over, and then we strap them and pull them back up. These solidify from outside to inside, so they're still soft in the middle. Okay. After we have taken them out of the furnace, we take them to what we call a homogenizing furnace. Now these are what we're calling our slabs. These are bigger. Okay. They're a different product than the billet used for a different application. But whether it be the slabs or the billet, they go through the homogenizer, and the homogenizer is somewhat like a tempering process. We're getting all the molecules lined up properly. If you left something on, on its own, over time, things do generally even out. You can take a piece of wood, and over time, the molecularly, it's going to even out. We just speed the process up by putting it into a heat treatment system like this. Some of the billets, can, depending on the size, can sit there for a day. If they're small, they might sit there for eight hours. It depends on the diameter and the chemistry. Okay. Here's some more billet. Some of them is finished, some isn't. The gray ones in the back have come out of the, of the furnace. They could have been homogenized, but they have not been scalped yet. Where it's shiny, we run them through our lathe, and they've been scalped. 
because when we sell it, it has, we're going to get it down to that stage. Okay. Now, it's still got some ends on it because we haven't cut the ends off yet because each customer has their own spec how, wide, how long they want to do, how wide, the diameter, and how long, both. Okay. What's happening here is it's, we're ultrasonically testing that billet. And the reason we're doing that is because we can see the outside. Okay, the outside looks nice and shiny and bright and looks really pretty and looks great. But we don't know what's on the inside. We could have inclusions on the inside. So what we're doing is we're testing for that. If we have any, then we have to scrap and start over. We cannot sell it because if you're selling something to, say you're using this for extrusions. Well, you get to a point where you find that you have an inclusion in there. Well, now when you send it to the extruder and he's extruding this long billet, he's going to run, he's going to have an imperfection in it. So it's going to kill his run. So that's why we're doing that. We check that. Okay. And these are, this is a closer view of the slabs. Okay. Now, as Jim was telling you, uh, ISRI has a lot of information. Uh, you can go on the ISRI guidelines and you'll find a lot of this information as far as the, the codes, the, the grades, as far as the specs for things maybe going overseas. For example, Taint Tabor, Tents, things like that. Those are specs for export. But one thing to keep in mind is you still need, if you're selling domestically, you still need to talk to your domestic consumer to find out what their specifications are. For example, uh, Taint Tabor. I will buy something that's similar to Taint Tabor, but I will take it free of iron because that's how we, that's our process in California. Now, when you go overseas with it, they can handle the iron. So it's important to get back to your consumer and find out exactly what their specifications are because the last thing you want to do is have a load sitting someplace in, the, in this country and have to bring it back or have to find another home for it or even to renegotiate it. You don't want to do that. Okay. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do, and Jim, I can borrow you one more time, is I've got some acid and some things to test. I think there's enough for everybody, but if not, then we might have to share. Okay, so you're on the scale in your, uh, in your business, or you have someone on, on your scale in the business, your business, and a piece of metal comes across the scale. And the guy who you have doing it says, you know, I'm not sure what this is. What do I do? Uh, how, do I, how do I pay for it? And, and that's a good question because if he pays for it wrong, you lost a lot of money. Or maybe you made a lot of money, but then you might have lost a customer. So it's absolutely essential to know how to test. So the first thing with aluminum is we know it's not going to be magnetic. So the first thing you got is you have your magnet. You're going to put your magnet on this right away. You're going to say, OK, we know it's not iron. Now we've limited it down to non-ferrous. So you're, you're partway there. Now, there are things like you have aluminum, which is lightweight. But then you also have something like magnesium, which is even lighter weight. And the, the thing about the magnesium, if the magnesium is in the aluminum, that can be a problem because our specs might say what we're going to make only allows for 0.5 magnesium. So now, if this gets mixed up in the aluminum that you're sending to me, it would end up in a cast, basically. That's what it, where it would end up because people most think it's cast. We have a problem. And we have to now either reject the load or talk to you about it or figure out how we're going to solve the issue. So this is lighter weight than actually the aluminum. If it's heavier than that, you might have zinc. Sometimes the zinc looks close enough to the aluminum. So you've got the zinc that's heavier, you've got the magma slider. Okay. You can look at the color. The bending, is, you can look at the properties of bending, and that helps you sometimes with the 1100 if it's a thin gauge, if it's not too thick. You can look at the color. A lot of times, the, the higher the zinc, the grayer it is. So you might not, and die cast is mostly uh, zinc. So you're going to check that out. One of the things you want to do, though, 
and actually Jim was alluding to this in one of his tests, is before you test something, if you're going to do acid or anything else, you need to sand that surface down. That's why in the packet that you got, you'll see there's a piece of sandpaper. Because whether it's acid testing or testing by machine, if you want to get a true reading, you got to make sure you're actually getting to the metal. So preparation is very important on that. The solution that you have is uh, cadmium chloride. So it's, uh, and in the sheets I gave you, there's uh, an SDS on there. So if you're taking it back, if they question you, you can show that to the, uh, the uh, people at the airport. And the other, of course, is the uh, analyzers, the nitron. I think I need to put a new name on there because you got this new one out now. So, Yeah, so I need, I need to add something to that. And then, of course, at our facility, we have spectrometers. So that's what we're using. And we will, we'll, we'll take a sample piece and then we'll put it on our spectrometer. Okay, and there's a, there's a picture of analyzer which you actually already saw. Okay, there's scratch testing. Uh, that's a very difficult test. And now I want you to do a little uh, lab work here. So if you take out, out of the pack the solution and the sandpaper and you have different metal there, if you would please uh, sand down the pieces so you have a clean surface and then put a drop of the acid on the clean surface. When you sand it down, also kind of blow it off so you're not, you don't have any residue still there. And the thing I always enjoy about this is, the most for me is when you get to the magnesium, it's a very active and vivacious and effervescent reaction. So you won't miss that one. But uh, this will help you. So basically what you're doing with this, and I'll keep talking while you're doing this if you don't mind, is there are different grades of aluminum. You have a high zinc aluminum, which generally has one price and, and different application than a low zinc aluminum which, uh, and zinc, which have different applications. So you're, when we talk about low zinc, we're talking about 1% or less. We talk about high zinc, we're talking about 1% or more. So, and when you're pricing it, depending on what we want to make, determines where we're going to, what we're making determines what we buy and what we put into it. Think of what we do as making beef stew. So many carrots, so much celery, so much potatoes, and at the end you have the taste that you want. Well, with us, we put different grades of scrap in, and at the end, we have met the chemistry that's been required by our customer. If there's any questions on, on this, let me know. I'll be glad to answer them. Yes? Um, sand, uh, sanding, grinding, filing, all the same. Right, right, yeah. Sanding is probably the slowest process, but uh, <laughs> it'd be hard to bring that many grinders here. <laughs> Has anybody found the magnesium yet? This is yours to take also. Yeah, so it has bubbling up and it's dark and bubbles up and the others don't bubble as much. Now there's gonna be a piece in there that there's no reaction. And that piece is the one that's 6061 and has very low zinc. Because this acid, cadmium chloride, reacts to the zinc that's in there and the mag. There are acids to use to check 2000 series and coppers, but I used to use them and I got away from them because you have to use more than one acid. And in that process, you're looking at different colors and there's a point where it's difficult to see a lot of the colors. You know, one of the things that uh, Jim was talking about was uh, the old ways of testing. Uh, when I was growing up in the business, we had a gentleman working for us who had been doing this for easy 40 years. And I, I was, so we're talking a long time ago, but he could put 
any of the brasses and the bronzes and the high temps on a grinder and watch that spark comes up, the color, the length, and he could tell us exactly what it was. Well, I think in the past 15 or 20 years, you won't find people like that anymore. They, they learned that, it was, a, it was a trade, it was a skill. It's, people don't do it anymore. You don't find the people that can do that. That's why you see the, so much uh, growth on the analyzers. Did everyone get, everybody find the uh, mag? Okay, that one's hard to miss. And did you see the pieces that were clear that had no reaction? Okay, so that's the one that has very low zinc in it. And the pieces that had the reactions, that's the ones that had the higher zinc content. Okay, now in your handouts, now I wanna spend some time talking about the different grades of aluminum. It's done numerically. So things that are in the 1000 series, that's gonna have more aluminum than anything else. 1100, 1350, the majority of that's aluminum. You get to something that starts with a 2000 series, that's gonna be mostly, well, I shouldn't say mostly. What it is, it's gonna have a higher percentage of copper. And we're gonna get some more slides a little bit further down to explain that even better. When you get to the 3000, 3000 is gonna have the manganese, 4000 has more silicon, the 5000 has the mag, the 6000 is gonna be silicon and mag, 7000, zinc. That's the one that, uh, 7075, that's probably the most common element that you're gonna run across there in, in the wrought alloys. And Jim had gone through wrought alloys in his presentation. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you some slides of particular types of metal. This is what's called a primary sal. This is coming from companies like Alcoa or Kaiser, and these are 99.6, 99.7% aluminum, and a balance, and I'm only talking about 0.3 left, so I'm talking about silicon and iron. And this is used, the primaries use a lot of it. In our billet operation, we use a lot of it because of what we're making, because we have no tolerance for too many other elements. Okay. Now, remember slide before the other one was showing the different series. So this is that 1000 series. Okay, so if you look at 1100, which is a very common alloy. Look at the silicon, 0.45, iron 0.4, I'm sorry, 0.44, 0 0.45, copper 0.05, it's really small, 0.2, and then manganese 0.05. Just about everything that we do at our level, and even the primary, as Jim was alluding to, it's never gonna be written out, it's always by symbol. And once you've worked with them for a while, it'd be easy for you to see it. Now the zinc is 0.1. So now what we're looking at is the remainder is all aluminum. So that's something that's good for us. Okay. Now look at the next one down, the 1350. Okay. So look at how it can change. The silicon 0.1, the iron 0.4, copper 0.05. And we're talking about very small traces of other things besides aluminum. And chrome 0.01, okay. zinc 0.05. 1350 EC wire. Your EC wire is only 1350 alloy. So if you're going to sell your EC wire and you're selling to a secondary, you're going to want to say, hey, look, this is EC wire. And in the back of your mind, you don't have to say, hey, I know what this is, but you're going to want to have a premium for it because it's, it's so good. Yes. yes. Yes, yeah. And, and you know, it's a good, very good question, Jim, because when we get a specification from a customer, they'll give us an upper and lower, and, the, and we have an aim. But if we get past any of the uppers and lowers, and, then they don't take it. But the, ra the range is still very, very tight. So that's a very good question. Thank you. Okay. 2,000 series. Remember I was saying that what you're looking for in... All these elements, all these alloys, is what is it that stands out? Okay, 
So remember, so 2000 is basically the main element there, other than aluminum. Because remember, aluminum is still going to be the majority. But look at where, what we happen when we look at 2024, which is the one on the top. Look at the copper, 3.8, 4.9. Okay, that's huge. So when we're looking for copper in our ingot side, we can put some 2024 into the furnace, if it, assuming it can tolerate the other elements. And now we don't have to put number one copper in. So we've saved some money by not going to number one copper versus using 2024. Now, one of the things I want to mention, because I thought about it as I was watching Jim, when we were talking about number one copper. We'll buy number one copper for our tandem operation, but our, when we buy number one copper, it's got to be all copper. No solder, no brass, no, it's just got to be copper. And number two copper is going to have that solder, it's got other stuff. So we're very careful that we don't get any of that, because it will mess up our chemistry. So strictly copper. Okay. Look at the, the 2219, your copper's even higher. 3000 series. Now we're looking at, look at the manganese in there. That got, the stuff starts to jump out at you after you look at it for a while. Okay. 3003. What's important about looking at 3003 versus 3004 is if you look at the silicon, you're looking at 0 0.6 for 3, 0.3 for 3004. Irons are the same. Coppers are pretty close. Manganese is pretty close. Well, it's the same. But you look at your mag. The 3003 doesn't have a mag, any mag in it. But you pick up in 3004, you pick up 0.8 to 1.3. So if we're making an alloy, that doesn't tolerate any mag, we're gonna go for 3003. If we can tolerate the mag, we say, okay, we'll buy the 3004, because it might be a lower price. With us, again, it's, it's and I'm gonna, I know it's repetitive, but it's uh, recoveries and, and chemistry. And that's what we keep looking at. Okay. All this information is in those handouts I gave you, so uh, that should help you going forward. 4000 series, Look at your silicon, you look at 4004, silicon's nine to 10 and a half. A lot of silicon there. And the, bene the reason you look at that is that if I were to go out and buy silicon in the open market, which we use a lot of silicon, all our alloys on our casting side are using anywhere from six to 12% silicon. Well, if I'm buying silicon in the market just by itself, the range could be $1.40 a pound. But if I can pick it up in some of this scrap, I don't have to use it. I can use it, I can replace. That's what we try to do as a secondary. We're replacing. The difference with us and a primary, primaries don't do the, the scrap as much. They want to have metal that's going to hit. They use a lot of primary. In our tandem side, we use a lot of primary for that reason. We can't make the mistake. But with the ingot, we have a little more latitude, so we try to do it with scrap. I'm rushing through a lot of this because there's a lot of material and really a short amount of time. But uh, still, feel free to stop me if you have a question. Okay, 5,000 series, what's going to jump out at you there is the magnesium. Uh, common element that you're going to have, 5052. And if you look at that, you got 5 up to 1.1. I'm sorry, you got 1.1. I'm sorry, 2.2 to 2.8 on the 5052, I was looking that up a lot. 5086 is another common element that uh, we buy periodically. So you look at your mag, 3.5 to 4.5. 6,000 is a very important one because in your scrap yards, you're gonna get 60-61 extrusion, you're gonna get 60-63 extrusion. And you're gonna get 60-61 that's not extruded and the question would be, what's the difference between the 61 and the 63? Well, it's going to come down to the chemistries again. If you look at the, uh, the iron, that's the biggest one right there. 60-61 iron, 0.7 versus 63.35. Even though it doesn't seem like a lot, that's a lot of difference. 
in, the, in that scrap. So that's the big one there. 7,000 series, we talked about that a little bit before. That's the one that's going to have the high zincs. Okay, 7075, very common element in your scrap yards coming through. And if you look at the 7075, your zincs are already 5.5.1 to 6.1. So a lot of zinc there. But if we're making something that needs zinc, that's what we're going to go to. We're going to go to that. If we're using the wrought alloys. Now, when we get to the casting alloys, it's going to be a little different story. The elements are going to be the same. The same, same ones that are, have the, the zinc here is going to be a seven. Uh, you're going to see we're going to have it in a 300 series. But we'll get to that. Now, as I was just starting to get work you into, this is for the castings. Okay. The same general numbers. So for the copper, it's going to be a 200 series. For the copper silicon mag, it's 300. And 400 is higher silicon. And the 500 is the magnesium. Okay. Now, when you get cast, the majority of what you're getting is something in 300 series. Because it's, it's automotive, it's barbecue grill, it's engine blocks, it's pistons, engine heads. That's what mostly is coming in, in that 300. And from that, we're going to pick up more of our zinc. Okay. Grain structure is a harder test to do. Uh, that's just something over a period of years. You can look at it and you start to identify what it is. But it's very, comp very hard to do. Okay. Now, just as we were looking at the four-digit series, we're going to do the same thing in the three-digit series. Okay. 2013, let's look at 201 at, at the very top. So you've got silicon at 0.1, iron point, 0.1, copper, 4 to 5.2. Again, that's 200, 2,000. That's your major element. 300 series. And this is the majority of casts that you're going to get. It's going to be in that 300 series. Now, you can have, well, I have to rephrase that too. But, uh, for example, 356. I'll talk about that one first. Anybody know what product is, that you get in your scrap that is 356? Wheels. Exactly right. That's, that is a product that has got a greater value than the other castings that you're going to get. And the question would be, I'm sorry. The auto wheels have a bigger value. And what you look at there is you see the silicon, six and a half to seven and a half. Because again, you're, you're buying the silicon in this one, in this alloy. Because if you look at everything else, it's what we call trace elements. And you look at your zinc, 0 0.05, hardly anything. So what we basically have here is aluminum and silicon and trace elements for the rest. So if we're going to make 356 alloy, we love to put scrap wheels in. Because if we don't do that, you can make it out of prime. There's a, there's a prime, a 350 prime. But it's a lot better for us to do it this way. Okay. 319, now that's more, of a, uh, that's more of a casting alloy. And your zincs are 1.0. And 380 is 0.1. So you have a, ver a variety in there once you get into that range. 400 series, you're picking up, look at the silicons in that, 11 to 13 in the 413. That's a, that's a lot. Okay. And you're picking up some copper and the rest, they're not quite trace elements, but they're not that high. So it's not, you can live with that. And if you look at 443, now you're looking at the same family, four, the 400, you look at the 443, you go from, say, the high side of 13 on silicon in the 413 to 6. So if I wanted to get silicon addition, I'd probably pay more for the 413 than I would for the 443. But then I still have to look at the other elements. I have to look at the other elements, see if they match whatever we're going to make. Because it all has to blend at the end of the day. 500, 5,000, high mag. Now, I'd like to take a minute or two, actually, to talk about one of the dangers that we have in our facility, 
same danger that you have in a steel foundry, any foundry, is explosions. I recently saw a video of some scrap being loaded into a furnace. It was actually aerosol cans, you know, the little cans that had been shredded, but it sat around for a while. So it got, it oxidized. And when this went into the furnace, First, there was a lot of steam coming out because explosions are created by steam. If you have a closed cylinder, back to that one. Let's take a look at a fire extinguisher. It's got one opening at the top. So let's say you get some water in there. If you get water in there and you put this in the furnace and it starts melting, well, the first thing that's happened is before that's melted, that water turns to steam. That steam now when you get further in the process, if you haven't melted that totally, you got steam turns into an explosion. Okay. That explosion is gonna, could kill somebody. It damages property, it could also kill somebody. So getting back to the story is some aerosol cans went in, they were oxidized, and went in a furnace. First thing we saw was steam coming up. Next thing we saw was a black smoke that encapsulated the operators that were outside it, and then a huge fireball after that. Fortunately, no one was hurt in that because the company had taken good precautions to make sure that the men were safe. But that's what can happen. It's a very dangerous situation. Okay, so when we get scrap, if there's any problems on it, we quarantine it until we can identify the problems and talk to the supplier. AC condenser, the same thing. You've only got one hole there right now. So this is, remember I said earlier, there is no bad scrap. So if you have scrap, you can find a mark for it. Just like the, this isn't bad scrap, it's not prepared yet. So for us to handle that, we have to have two outlets. One, so that no moisture can be trapped. So if, let's say rain, it's raining, the scrap's outside. Okay, rain gets into that. It's upside down. If there was a hole at the bottom or the bottom was cut, it wouldn't stay. It would go right through. So now it becomes safe. It's good aluminum. And now it's safe for us to load. And we would want that in a Gaylord box so we can inspect it before it goes to the furnaces. Uh, beer kegs. I keep the slide here, although I don't think it's been years since I've seen one come through because I don't think the beer companies even let you keep a keg anymore. But it's a great example because on the beer kegs, and I'm sure you all know, there's only one tap, there's one hole on the top, and that was it. So if one happened to come by, as long as the bottom is cut also, and I don't mean just a quarter size hole at that point, you need a big enough hole that nothing can be held in it, then it's good scrap. Okay. Remember I showed you the ingot that we make, and I said, no doubt it's not layered, it's smooth. These are layered cells. We don't take these. And there's two big reasons why we don't. One, if the chemistry from the bottom to the top could be totally different. Because these were poured at, two, at different times. Some of these were poured five, six different times. So what that meant is they melted some metal, they poured it into a mold. Then that's it. Then they melted some more metal, poured it into a mold. Well, we don't know if they had all cast, that's an MLC. The chemistry is going to be different. So that's not good for us. Also, the other thing is, on, our, on these sows, when they're making them, they tend to go down in the middle. And there, sometimes there's a hole there. Well, if they're stored outside, and it rains, and water gets into that hole, and it's into that cavity, now we have the same problem we have with other scrap. We have a we create steam, and we create a big explosion. That's why we don't take them, and I don't think anybody else is taking them either for that reason. And when we test the sow, these are not good sows, but if we were testing some sows that we got, we don't just take a corner anymore because the heavy metals tend to generate to the corners, meaning some of the tins, for example. We drill outside in. So we're taking the drillings all the way down to the center of it to get to the right chemistry on it. Because if you just take one part, you don't know where it's, whether it's accurate or not. So by drilling, we find what, it, you know, what the real chemistry is going to be. It's more work, but it's more accurate. 
and we have to be accurate what we do. Fire extinguishers. Remember I showed the first picture and I said if it's prepared properly, we can take it. Like this, we don't know without breaking that veil and putting extra time and labor into it, how safe these are. So if this particular slide would have just taken those, prepared them where there's two, two holes in it, top and bottom, and put it in a Gaylord box, we could feel comfortable about putting it into our furnace. This is a cylinder. The problem with this, if you look at the very bottom, you're gonna see a plug, and at the top, it's also sealed. And inside that can be grease, it can be any number of things in it. So if we can't tell what's inside something, we're not gonna take a chance of putting it in the furnace. Because remember, we want people, they come in in the morning, they work, and want them going home at night. We don't want anything happening to them. Oxygen bottle, again, I know it's repetitive, but this is all good metal, and it's prepared properly, we can buy it. So you got an opening at the top, and you need an opening at the bottom. Or it can be prepared where it looks like a boat. You slice it down the middle. Now it's, it's open. Closer version. Compress, I'm gonna go through some of these a little bit quicker. Okay, propane tanks. These are the same similar issues of preparation. Okay. ACSR, I wanna spend a minute on ACSR because Here's EC wire, okay, 1350, that's what we were talking about before. And if you have ACSR, that means there's gonna be iron in the middle, okay? See ACSR. The magnet, that's the magnet sticking to the very end. The reason it's sticking to it is because there's a piece of iron in there. If you put it on this, there will not be any iron. It won't, the magnet won't stick because there's no iron in it. But on that, it will because there's iron. And here's, another, here's a closer view of it. So we can't put that into our furnace. But I'm not saying it's not valuable, it is, but that's gonna probably go to a chopper. And that chopper, he can chop it, separate the iron out of it, and then he's got iron, he's got aluminum, he's got aluminum chops at that point. Then he can sell it to, to us, to any, anybody else who's looking for them. Because remember, that's good aluminum. Okay, yeah. And this is for strands. That's a number of strands, five strands, and it gives you recoveries. I understand that 1350, 1100, uh, the 1000 series. Thermofilm is 63 extrusion or 61. Yeah. No. No. With the ACR? Yeah. Well, the ACR is the same as this, but it's just got in the middle. So it won't be, if you're, gonna, if you're testing it and don't have magnet, it's gonna be, it won't be as soft as this because that steel is harder. Right. Well, if you're breaking that, see, some, it depends on thickness. So like, this is very thin, so it's easy to, easy to bend. If you have thicker uh, aluminum, it'd be harder to bend. Okay, thermofill, the problem with thermofill is in the middle is this rubber. That rubber is smokes a lot, it lowers your recovery, and believe it or not, the weight of that thermofill is very heavy in relation to the, to the aluminum. So we don't take it. Again, there is a process in it. It goes to choppers, and they chop it down, and they're able to blow off the thermofill. You know, and, and then it's used the product. So we've got the aluminum in front of it. Now the aluminum can come to the, to the smelter or primary, either one. Okay. Borings. Uh, this has come out of machine shops. You can have uh, high-grade borings and have uh, mixed borings. 1% zinc, 3% zinc. Again, with the borings, it's good to know the consumer you're selling to and what they like. We, we, we do uh, high-grade, which is 1%, and we do the mix, which is 3%. And we take that to the alloys we're going to make. Before we can melt it, though, uh, this is 24... 2024 borings, 61 borings, 75 borings. Each one of these has some physical properties that the more you work with it, the more you'll learn as to color. It might help, it gives you a lead into what you might have. 
and the physical properties, how they bend, how they break. Spinnings are just